Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Everything that is recorded in the Word of God has purpose. Some of those purposes are, are self-evident. We read a passage of Scripture and we understand what God is communicating to us. Other times we read Scripture and we may not see the, the, the how to apply it to our life. We may not see the wisdom of it. We may not understand it, but simply reading those words will indeed prove to be changes, will bring changes into our life spiritually. So even if you're not understanding all the things that you're reading in the Word of God, continue to read them. Plant them within your heart. Sow them within your soul in order that the Word of God becomes something that is part of your nature that you think and you make decisions based upon biblical truth. The more you know of the Word of God, the more when you are placed in a position of, of difficulty when you must make a decision, the more you know of God's will, the more you know of His scriptural revelation, you will be more likely to make God-pleasing decisions. And realize... It's those God-pleasing decisions that actually please us. They give us that peace that goes beyond all understanding. They give to us a contentment that the world cannot understand. And it's that contentment and that peace that is the strength, as we read in Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 10, it says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. So God gives us a joy that the world can't embrace, cannot understand, cannot comprehend. We receive it, and it allows us, it allows us to be overcomers. And it's in that overcoming that we have a God-pleasing testimony. Take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Exodus and chapter 37. The book of Exodus, chapter 37. Now, we, and my expectation is that this teaching this evening will be a, a brief one, a short one at least. That's how I've prepared it. And it's going to focus on two vessels that were in the tabernacle and, of course, later on in the temple. Two that we know very well. We've studied them previously in the book of Exodus believe in Exodus chapter 25, and now in chapter 37, we're going to review them. We're going to hear some of the same information, but shared differently, that it might indeed penetrate our very being, that we might understand what God wants to communicate to us through this scripture. So Exodus 37, beginning with verse 1. And Betzael, and remember, this is the man who had a wise heart, that God gave understanding in order that he could fulfill God's purpose. And we need to realize that that is an important principle. God gives wisdom, he gives understanding for the purpose, the role that he has called us to do. And this man, Betzael, he was equipped by God for work, the workmanship that required a, a superhuman ability and understanding to perform it. We'll see what I mean in a moment. But Betzael, he made the ark, and this is like a, a closet, a chest, the ark of acacia wood. 
and so much of, of the tabernacle and the vessels thereof were made of acacia wood. So once more, Bethsael, he made the ark of acacia wood, and its, its length were two and a half cubics. And its width was one and a half cubics. And its height, its height was also one and a half cubics in height. So once more, its length, two and a half cubics. Its width, one and a half cubics. And its height was also one and a half cubics. What else did he do with this acacia wood? Well, it says that he covered it. And this would be with a gold covering. He poured gold over this wood. And it was a pure gold, and he did it, not just on the inside, but also on the outside of this structure. So it was completely, totally covered with pure gold. And he made for it a zare. Now, this is the word for a wreath. And you think about it, a wreath is something that you put upon your head and it's kind of a border. Another way that we can think of it, in fact, another word that is used is carnies by, by many. And carnies in modern Hebrew is like a crown molding, a decorative border. And this is what we find that Betzel was instructed to do. Look again. He made for it, that is for the ark, this, this golden wreath round about, this border, this, this crown molding. Look at verse 3. And he casted for it four rings of gold upon the four, and this would be one of the words for sides. Now, remember, the Ark of the Covenant was just that, a chest. It had sides. And we're talking about, we're talking about two of the sides. Each of these two sides had two rings. We'll see this in a moment. But look again at verse 2. We read in the middle of that, or actually verse 3. And he cast it for it for the chest, the Ark of the Covenant. He casted for it four rings of gold upon the four, and here we have it, the four sides, two rings upon one side and two rings upon the second side. So we have four sides, but we're going to see that only two of them had the rings. And what were these golden rings for? Well, once more, we read in verse 4, and he made, and this is the word, badim. Now, these badim, they were like poles. Now, you might recall that last week we talked about the tabernacle structure, and in the various planks, those boards, there were also a type of pole but we could also translate it as a bar. And the reason why it's a bar is for the purpose of locking things together and securing them. So it was for the purpose of stability. These poles, and they have a different name, these poles are for an entirely different purpose. And what is that? Once more, verse 4. And make poles or yeah, poles of acacia wood, and once again, that they shall be covered, covered them, and he covered them with gold. And he brought, verse 5, these poles into the rings upon the sides of the ark, and here's what it's for, to carry them, in order that the ark of the covenant could be transported, and we know something, Israel was on a journey. They went to approximately 40 different locations during these 40 years. You see this in the scripture. 
The places are, are named where they travel to before entering into the promised land. And therefore, the Ark of the Covenant, as well as all the tabernacle, it needed to be portable for moving. And God was leading them, and as God led them, they would stop from place to place, and there, as God led, they would worship. Meaning this, God would stop, remember, he would lead them, by a pillar of cloud at nighttime or at, during the day and a pillar of fire at night. I want to say that again. A pillar of cloud by daytime and a pillar of fire by night. And when these clouds stop moving, the children of Israel, they would make an encampment. And what would they do? They would set up the tabernacle in order that they might worship God. And they would worship God until God moved. So we see a very important principle. And that is the principle of worship as a prerequisite, as a, a preliminary activity for moving in the will of God. So if you're not worshiping properly, you are not going to be traveling in the right direction. You're not going to be where God wants you to be. And if you're not in the right location, you're not going to be able to do the right things. You won't be able to accomplish his purpose, his will. So we see worship. Going back to the book of Genesis, it's foundational. It is why God made you and me. Sin caused a problem. It made us unable to worship God. But through the work of redemption, and we talked about last week how this book of Exodus is also, I hope you remember this, is also called the book of redemption. And we see how the first half of the book dealt with redemption, the Passover story. And the second half deals with worship, the laws, the instructions of worshiping God. So worship is foundational if we're going to arrive where God wants us to be. Look again at the end of verse, verse 5. For the carrying of the ark, verse 6. Now, if you were to ask, what is the most important part of this Aaron, Aaron Habrit, the ark of the covenant? The answer would be, it's lid, the covering. Now, remember something. We have been told that the ark itself is made from acacia wood, which is covered over, we might say plated, if that's the right word. There is a covering of gold, pure gold, on the inside, outside, everything. The rings are gold, and the poles, although they were made from acacia wood, they were also covered with gold. So everything is acacia wood or gold or covered with gold. But this next verse is going to talk about a very important place, the lid, the covering of the Ark of the Covenant. Look, if you would, to verse 6. Now, another way that this Ark is spoken of is the Ark of Testimony. Why? Because God would testify before the people by dwelling on this ark. Where exactly? Well, let's read verse 6, and we'll get some information about it. Verse 6. And he made a kaport. Now, the term kaport comes from the Hebrew word kapara. Kapara comes from the word lekaper, which is to make atonement. And the word atonement is a covering. So we see that the covering for the Ark of the Covenant called Kaporet was indeed a, a covering, and it teaches us about atonement. He made a kaporet of gold, pure gold, and it, of course, was its, its length was two and a half cubits, and its width was one and a half cubits in order that it fit properly on top of the ark. Now look at verse 7. And he made, this is still Bethsael, 
he made two cherubim, in Hebrew, kruvim. And these kruvim, these cherubim, were also of gold. And notice this next word, miksha. What's miksha? Well, the word kashe is hard. And what we need to remember is this, that the, the menorah, as well as, and we'll study the more menorah next week, but the, the mercy seat, which also is another name for the kaport, it was made from one lump of gold. And we see here that on, and it was actually, and the word of God is going to reveal this, it was actually part, the cruel beam were not stuck on them. They were made from this one lump of gold. So Betzael with, and it says Mikshe, which is hard, and it probably has to do with hammering. He took a piece of gold and he hammered it into the shape for the lid. And on that lid, he also hammered from that same piece of gold. And this is miraculous how someone could do this. He also made these kruvim, these cherubim. Look at verse, verse 7. And he made two kruvim of gold. The, the work of a, a beating, he made them from the two sides, meaning on the two sides of the mercy seat of the caport that lid. Verse 8. One cherub was at one end, and the other cherub was at the other end, and here it says, Min ha kaport asa et ha kruvim, mishne kitsovtaf, which means from the mercy seat, make the kruvim. That tells us that they were not a separate work that was placed upon, but they were part of the workmanship of the kaport, of the mercy seat that lit. And imagine that, making, knowing how to beat and form these cherubim in the position we'll come to in a moment, that they would be sitting at both ends of the, the lid for the Ark of the Covenant. Now look, if you would, to verse 9. And the crewing, they shall be spreading forth their wings. Up above, covering with their wings, upon the mercy seat, and their faces, each one to the other. To the mercy seat, that is the caport, the faces of the cruel V. Now, what does that mean? Well, when we look at it again, it says here that they should make the cruel V, that is Betzael, he should make it with their wings spread out. Now, in what direction? Spreading outside, facing away? No. They, they are spreading their wings, but it says they should do so upward, but with their wings, they are also, also towards the, the caport, meaning not, not away, facing out. So if the ends of the caport were, were where my two hands are, they would be facing inward. Their wings would be spread, but also inward and not outward. And this is supported as we read on where it says, their faces, each one of them is to the other. So they face one another, but even though they are towards one another. They are facing down towards the mercy seat, which is a sign, the rabbinical scholars say, of humility. And the reason why they're looking down is because, and we see this in the book of Numbers, chapter 8 and verse 89, and let's just turn there if we could, a very important scripture, the book of Numbers, and this is when Moses is dedicating, inaugurating the tabernacle for worship. Numbers chapter 8 
and the very last verse of that eighth chapter. The book of Numbers, chapter 8. And look with me, if you would, to the very last verse, Numbers chapter, excuse me, chapter 7. The book of Numbers, chapter 7, and the very last verse, verse 89. This is when Moses enters into the Holy of Holies, something that he only did one time for the purpose of inaugurating the worship of the tabernacle. It says, and when Moses came to the tent of the meeting, that's another word for the tabernacle, to speak with him, to speak with who? To speak with God. He heard the voice speaking to him above the kaport, this mercy seat, this lid, which is upon the ark of the testimony between the two cherubim, that is the two kruvim. He was speaking to him, that is God. So the presence of God, what we talked about last week, the Shkinat Hashem, the very dwelling presence of God was in that Holy of Holies above dwelling on the Ark of the Covenant upon that mercy seat, that covering. Very important. Well, let's go back to chapter 37 of Exodus, and we'll move now to our second se section, dealing with the, the lechem panim, that is the showbread and the table that this showbread was upon. Look now to verse, verse 10. And he made the table once more of acacia wood. And we have the links. It was two cubics in, in length and one cubic in width and one and a half cubics in height. So again, once more, two cubics was its length. One cubic was its width, and it was of a height of one and a half cubics. Verse 2. Having been made from this acacia wood, it probably is not going to surprise us. Look at verse 11. And he covered it with pure gold. And he made for it, just like he did for the Ark of the Covenant, he made for it a golden wreath around that is that, that crown mold, molding, that boarding, that carnese, which is a type of, of decoration. And it shows something very important, that these vessels were supposed to have a, a look, an appearance that showed a workmanship, a quality, a thought process, something that showed that it was not just for any type, of, of purpose, but for a godly, a holy purpose. Verse 12. And he made for it, that is for the shulchan, a framework. Now, this framework is also a, a border, and it is a tofat saviv, which means it's approximately the distance from here to here. So it had below the, the wreath that went around, it had an additional piece known as a misgared, and that's a framework. So it was an added decorative place that was upon the table for the showbread. Verse 13. It probably doesn't surprise us that here... Verse 13 says, and to cast for it, for this table, four rings of gold. And these rings of gold, they shall put these rings upon the four, and it's a different word. It's not the four sides, but the four corners, which are upon the four feet. Now, what we have are legs, however you want to understand this. So a table has legs. Most tables, four legs, and each of them had a ring upon it on each of the sides for the same purpose that we're going to, to be told that the Ark of the Covenant had. Why do I say that? Look at verse 14. And close to the 
border. This is this misgeret. This is that, that extra piece that is about the width of a hand that were for the rings. That's where they were placed. And these rings were for houses, for the poles. So also we see that, that there were poles that were made for, for these, this shulchan, this table of showbread. And what was the purpose of, of these rings? To put the poles into it. So once again, look at the end of verse 14. Let's set et hashulchan in order that the table could be carried. It too, as all the structures were, were portable, movable. And, and one of the things, and here's an important principle that we need to learn, and that is that worship, and I've said this at least a half a dozen times in our studies, worship brings change. So as they would go from place to place, they would have different experiences. On the journey, they would encounter different obstacles. They would see God's provision. And they learned a lesson, a new lesson, a new reason for worshiping God. They had an experience of godly testimony in their life, how God manifested his reliability, that he's trustworthy, that he's dependable. And this is important because without embracing that, without accepting that God is trustworthy, you can't enter into the promises of God. They could not enter into the promised land. Look now at verse 15. And he made, and now we're talking about the poles, he made the poles of once more acacia wood. He covered them with gold. Why? What we're just told. To carry the table so we see twice here that this table it mentions that it's to be carried and i want to talk a few minutes before we wrap up about one of the theological messages of the shulchan lechem hapanim the table of the showbread and that is this was in the holy place and the priest would serve. And as they experienced the presence of God, and remember, the showbread means the bread of the presence. It's the word for face, the face of God. And this word face can mean presence, but it's also understood symbolically as blessing. So the priests, as they serve God, as they drew near to God, they experienced his presence and they received his provision because they would eat from this bread once a week on Shabbat. And this bread was a blessing unto them. This bread would, would mediate to them much of the attributes, the quality, the nature of God. For example, according to tradition, the bread would always be warm. It was removed from the oven and placed upon, and we'll talk about the shelf that was placed upon in a moment. But for that entire week, it stayed fresh, tari. It stayed, it stayed warm, cham. And this defies what? It defies the, the normal experience that bread would have in this world. Time would affect the bread. It would cool off, and the hours pass, it would be less fresh, and it would become after weeks stale. I mean, we've all heard of day-old bread is cheaper, but week-old bread, but in the holy place. That week had no effect. Those seven days did not impact the quality. And what does this speak to? Overcoming the things, the limitations of this world. And that's what being intimate, drawing close to God, experiencing His presence, being recipients of His blessings, that's what we become. We are not any longer under the laws of this world, but we can, we can transcend them in worship for the purposes of God. Look now to verse 15 once more. And He made these poles 
of acacia wood. He covered them with gold in order to carry the table. Verse 16, our last verse. And he made the kelim. Those are vessels. Now, the, the table for the showbread did not only consist of a table that had these rings and poles, but also we see four other utensils mentioned. And what are those? Well, it says, And he made the vessels which were upon the table, or concerning the table. He made the, and the word here is karot. Karot is bowls. And this is what, what normally is believed where the bread would set upon. So these places that the bread was set upon. Secondly, we see that it also made the kapotav. Kapot. Kapot. If you hear this today, it would be spoons. And this would be the utensil that would remove the bread from the oven to place it upon these bowls. And then they were placed. Then they were placed. Keep reading. And we have two words here. The word me naki yotav and the word ha kashot. Now, the first word has to do with the, the pillars. Now, we see something. We see that the, the bread was not placed directly upon the table, but we see that there was shelves. And these shelves will come to in a moment, but there was an apparatus that held these shelves. And it might be thought of as the framework, the structure, where these shelves, and we see the next part, these shelves were. So when we look at it carefully, these shelves were placed, and they were, most would feel that they were permanent within that structure, the pillars that held the shelves that made this apparatus where they could bring the showbread on a bowl and place it upon the individual shelf. And we know, we're not told here, but there were 12 showbreads made each week. Every week they were replaced. Why 12? Well, 12, we think of the 12 tribes, we think of the people of God, but also 12 is a kingdom number because Israel is a kingdom word. And what we find here is worship brings us into a kingdom experience. And if you're really a believer in the kingdom, you're going to make worship a priority. And, and you're not going to be satisfied or agreeable to what many are passing off as worship today, but whether you are going to be wanting to worship God in spirit and truth. Now, obviously, we don't have a tabernacle or a temple today, but the Holy Spirit, He dwells within us. And there's much, and I want to emphasize this, there's much in the way of instruction in the New Covenant in regard to worship, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, but doing so as a testimony, bringing a song, bringing a psalm, bringing a word, all these things in order that God's truth is revealed. Remember, there's a correlation between worship and revelation, also worship and adoration, and worship as a preparation for service. All these things are taught. Let's look one more time at verse 16. And he made the vessels concerning the table, the bowls, the spoons, the, the pillars and the shelves, which he cast, they were cast, and it says, of gold, pure gold. So when we looked so, so carefully at these, these instructions, every part of it had a purpose. And I'll close with this. A wise individual will study these things prayerfully, 
asking the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, who dwells within every believer to be our teacher, to give us greater insight. We just scratched the surface so far in our study of the tabernacle. But this hopefully is an encouragement, a motivation for you to go deeper. You, perhaps a few friends, family members, and the leadership of the Holy Spirit to take you to a greater understanding of God's revelation. And when I speak of His revelation, I'm speaking of scriptural revelation. Well, I'll conclude with that until next week. And we continue on in this 37th chapter of the book of Exodus. Until then, shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Shalom from Israel.